Now it is time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Alex. We have uh, Andrew Weissman joining us tonight and Adam Pollack, who used to work in the Attorney General's office here in New York State. Both have much to teach us about the status of defendant Trump tonight. Candidate defendant. I'll be yes, watching. Exactly. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Have a good show. Well, we have breaking news about defendant Trump at this hour. He appears to have violated the judge's gag order on mentions and attacks of jurors in his case. On Donald Trump's social media website tonight, Donald Trump reposted something posted by the 8 p.m. host on Fox, Jesse Waters. Jesse Waters says they are catching undercover liberal activists lying to the judge in order to get on the Trump jury. And there's Donald Trump himself posting that on social media tonight, posting it for the jurors in his case to see, calling them liberal activists and liars. Donald Trump calling his jurors who have already been seated liars because what Jesse Waters is referring to there are the jurors, the seven who have already been officially seated on that jury. That's who he's referring to. Then he's saying that they have lied their way onto the jury. Donald Trump is endorsing that. Those words are the same as Donald Trump writing them himself. That was Donald Trump's choice to violate his gag order tonight, possibly in the very worst way. In fact, definitely in the worst way he has violated this gag order so far. This is a severe test now of what Judge Juan Marchand is prepared to do with Donald Trump violating the gag order in the worst possible way by attacking, specifically attacking, the seven jurors already seated in this case. Judge Marchand has already tolerated, which is to say not acted yet on, the claims by the district attorney that Donald Trump has violated the gag order in other ways. But this is by far, by far, the most severe way Donald Trump can violate that gag order by going after the jurors in his, ca his case. This is by Donald Trump, by any interpretation, juror intimidation. This is specifically aimed at intimidating the seven people already seated on that jury and anyone else who might be seated on that jury, that when you're seated on Donald Trump's jury, you will be attacked, you will be publicly attacked uh, by Donald Trump and his allies in the news media. This is the challenge that uh, Juan Marchand, Judge Juan Marchand, is going to have to deal with immediately in this case. Uh, he has... Uh, paused the, his timing on hearing the, the question of violations of the gag order already. But this one, with uh, jury selection in process, ready to resume tomorrow morning, this one, uh, it seems impossible to see how the judge can wait on that. We'll discuss that in a moment uh, with Andrew Weissman. It's always important to remember something about Donald Trump and the way he lies, because no one proves just how much Donald Trump lies better than Donald Trump. And he did that again today. And this time he proved that his lawyers are liars too. Donald Trump has claimed repeatedly that the Manhattan criminal trial that he must now attend has kept him from campaigning for president. His lawyers have falsely represented the same thing publicly. Judge Juan Mershon said at the outset, that there will be no Wednesday session in the criminal trial of Donald Trump. So Donald Trump knew all along there would be no session today. And today, when Donald Trump had no obligation in court anywhere in the country, Donald Trump did absolutely nothing. The crucial Electoral College state of Pennsylvania is only an hour away from Donald Trump's Manhattan apartment at Trump motorcade speed. President Trump, President Biden was campaigning. Once again, today in Pennsylvania, but Donald Trump did nothing, nothing, no campaigning at all. Maybe Donald Trump spent the day napping in a more comfortable chair than the courtroom chair that he has reportedly managed to doze off in this week. Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyers 
spent the day pondering once again what a catastrophe it would be if Donald Trump attempted to testify in his own defense. Because today, District Attorney Alvin Bragg and his team of prosecutors in a required filing in the case revealed all of the issues that they would use to attack Donald Trump's credibility in cross-examination on the witness stand if Donald Trump testifies. The notice submitted to Judge Michon says, quote, the people hereby disclose a list of all misconduct and criminal acts of the defendant not charged in the indictment, which the people intend to use at trial to impeach the credibility of the defendant. If the defendant chooses to testify, the people intend to inquire regarding the following. The first item on the district attorney's notice was the case won by Attorney General Letitia James against Donald Trump in which Donald Trump is now ordered to pay $354 million judgment. The district attorney described the case this way, quote, defendant repeatedly and persistently falsified business and underlying records, conspired to falsify business records, issued false facts, financial statements, conspired to issue false financial statements, and conspired to commit insurance fraud by fraudulently misstating the value of his assets for economic benefit, including the Trump Tower triplex by overstating its square footage by nearly three times. Now, every member of that Manhattan jury knows either exactly or almost exactly how many square feet their apartment is. None of them could overestimate the size of their Manhattan apartments by three times. No juror with a studio apartment thinks that they live in a three-bedroom apartment. Those facts used against Donald Trump on the witness stand would be devastating. But the district attorney would present more in cross-examining Donald Trump and attacking his credibility. Quote, defendant testified untruthfully under oath when he claimed that his public comments about a judge's law clerk were instead about a witness. Court held as the trier of fact, I find Trump's testimony rings hollow and untrue. Defendant intentionally violated court order by making public attacks on a judge's law clerk despite two prior court orders not to do so. Court fined defendant $10,000. Defendant committed repeated and persistent fraud in the transaction of business by fraudulently misstating the value of his assets. All of that is just from that one case that the attorney general won against Donald Trump. And of course, the district attorney intends to use both of the E. Jean Carroll cases against Donald Trump if Donald Trump takes the witness stand. If Donald Trump testifies in the case, the district attorney would refer to the E. Jean Carroll cases in cross-examination this way. Quote, jury awarded E. Jean Carroll $83,300,000 in compensatory and punitive damages for defamatory statements defendant made about her. Defendant sexually abused E. Jean Carroll. Jury awarded the plaintiff $2,020,000 in compensatory and punitive damages on her sexual abuse claim. The district attorney will also use a finding in a lawsuit Donald Trump filed against Hillary Clinton. Quote, Court sanctioned defendant and ordered him to pay $937,989 in fees for filing a frivolous bad faith lawsuit. The court held, quote, he is the mastermind of strategic abuse of the judicial process, and he cannot be seen as a litigant blindly following the advice of a lawyer. The district attorney would also use the criminal conviction of the Trump business People versus the Trump Corporation. Quote, Trump Corporation and Trump Payroll Corp. Convicted of 17 felony counts of scheme to defraud conspiracy, criminal tax fraud, and falsifying business records in connection with a scheme to pay unreported non-cash compensation to top executives, including Alan Weissenberg. And the district attorney would use another civil case against Donald Trump, won by Attorney General Letitia James. Quote, Defendant illegally allowed his 2016 presidential campaign to orchestrate a fundraiser for the Donald J. Trump Foundation, direct distribution of the funds, and use the fundraiser and distribution of the funds to further defendant's political campaign. Court ordered defendant to pay $2 million for breach of fiduciary duty and waste. Defendant stipulated to the dissolution 
of the Donald J. Trump Foundation to resolve claims by the New York Attorney General to breach of fiduciary duty and waste failure to properly administer charitable assets, improper political activity, unlawful coordination with the Trump political campaign, and repeated and willful self-dealing transactions. Donald Trump's lawyers will surely oppose every one of these cases being brought up at trial. Judge Juan Mershon will hold a hearing on this issue after jury selection is complete. That hearing could occur as early as Friday. Donald Trump is by far the stupidest Republican presidential nominee in history, but he thinks and in many cases, he may be right about this, that his voters are stupider than he is. And that's why he complained today about only having 10 preemptory challenges to use against potential jurors in the jury selection process. The Trump defense and the prosecution ha each have already used six of their 10 challenges with seven jurors seated in the case with an additional five jurors necessary to complete the 12 person jury plus six alternates yet to be chosen. Today on social media, Donald Trump said, I thought strikes were supposed to be unlimited when we were picking our jury. I was then told we only had 10, not nearly enough. Donald Trump's lawyers have known or should have known from the day Donald Trump got indicted a year ago, that for the crimes he is charged with, every defendant in the state of New York and every prosecutor gets 10 preemptory challenges. 10. If Donald Trump went out on a Fifth Avenue and shot someone and murdered that person, then he would get 20 preemptory challenges for a Class A felony. 20. There is no place in America where any defendant gets an unlimited number of peremptory challenges. That doesn't exist. But Donald Trump believes that his voters are too relentlessly ignorant to know that. The Trump voters who do know that are all of the Trump voters who have been criminally charged for their attack on the Capitol on January 6th. They learned that the hard way. There are places that you would get less than 10 challenges, many places. The state of Arizona, in its infinite wisdom, under the control of the Republican state legislature, is the only state that has decided to give criminal defendants like Donald Trump exactly zero preemptory challenges. Leading off our discussion tonight is Andrew Weissman, former FBI general counsel and former chief of the criminal division in the Eastern District of New York. He is an MSNBC legal analyst, and he's co-author of the New York Times bestselling book, the Trump indictments, the historic charging documents with commentary. Also with us, Adam Pollack, former assistant attorney general for the state of New York. And somewhere around the corner is Adam's eighth grade daughter, Madeline, who's here <laughs> on uh, Take Your Daughter to Work Night. Uh, so great to have her here. Andrew, I want to go straight uh, to this uh, Trump uh, attack on the jurors in his case. Him uh, quoting on social media, they are catching undercover liberal activists lying to the judge in order to get on the Trump jury. Uh, this looks like a very sharp challenge for Judge Mershon and enforcing his gag order about jurors. Yeah, so let me just fill you in on March 26th of this year, Judge Mershon issued an order to the parties and the relevant part, and I'm gonna read it, says the following quote, that Donald Trump and any party um, are prohibited from doing the following, making or directing others to make public statements about any prospective juror or any juror in this criminal proceeding. So it's very hard to see why Donald Trump isn't really egging on the judge to say, um, I am now in contempt. Uh, you know, for whatever political purposes he may be doing that, he is clearly asking for it. And I think that it is incumbent on the judge to treat him like any other party. Um, it is, as I have said repeatedly, the road to hell to not treat him like everyone else. Um, and it's very hard to see the defense that's going to be made. I would, am not going to be surprised at all if the district attorney revises their pending motion to encompass this. Um, and I think the judge will certainly want to give an opportunity for the defense to be heard 
that is required by due process, but I, it's very hard to see why there will not be sanctions uh, for this conduct. So, uh, Adam, the judge already has a motion pending uh, from the district attorney about comments Donald Trump's made about witnesses, uh, Michael Cohen, witnesses who've been talked about publicly a lot by a lot of people. The judge didn't exactly race uh, to protect Michael Cohen in, in that situation. Jurors are a whole different status in a situation like this. This seems like a matter uh, that Judge Marchand is going to have to deal with in an, on an emergency basis. I think that's right. I think we already saw already in the trial this week him reprimanding President Trump, former President Trump, for talking around in the presence of a juror. He was already holding him to task. I think he will go directly to this and meet out a, the punishment if necessary. Yeah, and, and Andrew, it, it goes to this question of punishment. And I, I know that all these judges in the back of their minds are, are facing something like this. And this is the worst one we've seen by far. This is worse than anything we've seen in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is jurors. These are specific seven people that he's talking about lying there. Uh, there's the issue of what can you do? Uh, a former president who has Secret Service protection mandated by law, there's nothing anyone can do to remove that Secret Service protection. Joe Biden can't order it away. It's mandated by law. The idea that a, a local judge in Manhattan could uh, send Donald Trump to Rikers Island jail with a, a Secret Service delegation of a couple of dozen uh, 24 hours a day for whatever period of time we're talking about, that would be several shifts of Secret Service agents. Uh, that would require a hearing where the Secret Service is testifying about can they protect him there. They will surely testify that they don't know how to do that, uh, never having done anything like it. I mean, I know that the judge is just envisioning, unlike any other defendant I could be dealing with, putting this person in jail has logistical and practical challenges that may be beyond their capacities, which then I suppose could open a question like, do you give him home confinement uh, and, as an alternative to that? And, and in that case, make the Secret Service, in effect, be his jailers as well as his protectors. So I hate to sound like a sort of hardened former prosecutor, but that um, plea falls on deaf ears to me. Um, it, there are places in jails that somebody can be kept very safe. Um, and so, you know, put him in a, in a cell with no one else in that cell. Um, there, no one else is going to get to him. You're, if you're concerned about sort of the reason Secret Service is there is so that there isn't some, you know, crazy person who's going to take it upon themselves to take a shot at um, some, some public figure or former public figure. And, you know, that is something that is less of a concern in um, various places um, that are in federal and state prisons. Um, there's also ways to put somebody in lockup for a temporary period of time in the courthouse. Um, but that's all, you know, remember the first step, I think, uh, is uh, fines that are one of the mandated mm -hmm. uh, uh, sanctions. And then a second step can be jail up to 30 days for any single violation. If you have multiple violations here, there are already three alleged violations. This would be a fourth. It could be 30 days and 30 days and 30 days and 30 days. I usually don't do math in public, but I think that comes to 120. Um, and you don't have to go to the maximum at first, but you can easily, what is in the term of art is step him back. Um, and so he spends some time, like a child, in time out. Um, Secret Service is something that I think people have put far too much weight on as something that means that somebody, just because they have Secret Service protection, can't do jail time. In this country, no one is above the law. And if, if it is determined that jail is appropriate, then Secret Service will have to just figure it out as part of the rule of law in this country. Uh, Adam, one of the reasons I mentioned Secret Service, uh, among many reasons, in this very courtroom, Judge Mershon, when the question uh, arose of Donald Trump joining the sidebars, he was very concerned about that because Secret Service agents would have to accompany Donald Trump to the sidebars, which I submit 
is utterly ridiculous. But that is how cowed most people are, including judges, by the Secret Service. That courtroom could not possibly be safer. There are already Secret Service agents in it. The idea that Donald Trump is going to move from his chair over to here and somehow, by being surrounded by lawyers, is in danger is just one of those indicators of just how cowed by the notion of presidential protection uh, delegations judges and other people can be. Uh, but as we go forward here, uh, it, it seems this is really the crucial moment for Judge Mershon. And it seems like Donald Trump is trying to find that line. He's trying to find the spot where I can either prove to you that you cannot put me in jail, you won't dare put me in jail, and I'll prove it to you, or the other side of the Trump crazy coin, you'll put me in jail, and I will somehow have some martyr status because of that. I think these are great observations about the Secret Service. The New York State courtrooms are safe. Yeah. They've been made safe. There's multiple layers of security. He can move around the courtroom safely. It's a great point. And as Andrew Wiseman just said, there can be multiple levels of punishment, of contempt, to get him to a point where he stops doing this without getting to these fears that you've just mentioned. If the judge wants to start with a fine, if the judge wants to start with a home detention, he can take steps to ensure that Trump is complying with his orders. All right, we're going to squeeze in a quick break here, uh, and we're going to be back with Andrew Weissman and Adam Pollack on this breaking news about Donald Trump's very, very clear now violation of the judge's gag order and other matters for defendant Trump. We'll be right back. And we're back with Andrew Weissman and Adam Pollack. And just to restate the breaking news of the night at this hour, Donald Trump has violated a court order and a gag order on him about mentioning anything about the jurors in his criminal trial uh, tonight on social media. He uh, posted something written by Jesse Waters, the 8 p.m. host at Fox. These are lies by Fox, promulgated by Fox and Jesse Waters about the jury. Uh, and it says... And Donald Trump posted this himself. It says they are catching undercover liberal activists lying to the judge in order to get on the Trump jury. That is a slanderous lie by the slander headquarters at Fox News who've already been found to be corporate and public liars in that forum to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars that they have uh, had to pay uh, because of that. This is another case of that. Uh, by Jesse Waters lying about the seven jurors already seated in this case. Donald Trump adopted that lie on his own, put it on social media tonight, violated uh, the judge's order in the case for all parties to never say anything about jurors and violated the specific gag order on Donald Trump. And Andrew Weissman, uh, what are you expecting now? Uh, tomorrow morning when Judge Mershon gavels this case, uh, back into into the process of jury selection. Uh, will we? Do you expect to hear about this as the first item of business tomorrow? Yes. Um, quickly, let me just point out the fact of the statements being lies or truthful is irrelevant to the issue. Just to be clear, the gag order, the order from Judge Mershon, was not making any public statements. So even if they were truthful, it would be a violation. This is basically the gag order is do not speak about any juror or prospective juror. Um, and that's why th this is something that is very clean for and clear for the judge to respond to. What I would expect is going to happen is leaving aside that I think that the DA is clearly going to raise this. I think Judge Marshawn is going to say, I will deal with the issue of what the punishment is after I hear from both parties. But in the interim, I am telling you this is stopping immediately. I could also see him ordering that this post be taken down immediately. And then he will work, he will impose, I think, sort of requirements of due process to hear from both sides as to why this is or is not a violation of the order. But I think judges are particularly sensitive to issues involving civilian jurors. In my experience, that is sort of a, you know, a line that just cannot 
be crossed. And so I just, I, it's hard for me to imagine that Judge Mershon right now is not livid. Um, and I think at the at the very least, it will be the first thing that comes up tomorrow, in my view. Uh, Adam, uh, turns out the work of the attorney general uh, in the civil matters against Donald Trump uh, and uh, has now become relevant to this case. Here you see the district attorney saying, if Donald Trump takes the witness stand, and this is a, a filing they are required to file, if he takes the witness stand, what would we what, what might we want to use from other cases? to attack his credibility. They have presented basically all of the work of the attorney general uh, showing, uh, all, and it's about fraudulent business records, which is what this case is about. The Stormy Daniels payoff is about four fraudulent business records. The list that you read earlier, the list that came from the district attorney's office is a long list. Mm -hmm. He has done a lot of prior bad acts that they government that the prosecution can use to impeach his credibility, to attack his credibility, should he choose to testify in this case. Uh, Andrew, of that list, uh, what do you expect the, uh, the, the judge would actually allow? Now, I just want to insert the parentheses here. Donald Trump is never going to take the witness stand in this case. And one of the reasons we know that is everything we're seeing on this list. However, the judge still has to make a ruling ahead of time for the defendant, if you do take the witness stand, I am going to allow them to bring up the E. Jean Carroll case or to bring up what you did to that clerk in the other case uh, or to bring up the attorney general's case. Will, will all of these uh, survive as the district attorney wants them to as possible avenues of attack of uh, Donald Trump if he took the witness stand? So I'm a couple of things. I'm sure that Donald Trump will use whatever is allowed by the judge um, as cross-examination material as an excuse to say, well, because yeah. the judge is allowing this, now I'm not going to testify. Um, he is he is never going to testify. It is, it is really going to be the end of the road for him in this case. The prosecutors here are far too good and have way too much ammunition um, for that to ever be a successful strategy. And defense attorneys like Susan Necklace know that. Um, so, um, you know, maybe he will do something incredibly foolish, but I doubt it. Um, with respect to the list of items, it is worth noting that the state here is seeking two things. It is saying it is entitled to bring out some of this information, not all, but some of it, regardless of whether uh, Donald Trump testifies or not. And in the alternative says, to the extent that you think some of this can't come in, regardless of whether he testifies, some of it should be allowed, sort of the remainder should be allowed as cross-examination material if he testifies. So there's sort of two separate issues before the judge. I don't think all of it will come in, but you know there there is so much cross-examination material. And leave aside what's on this list. Um, as you know, Lawrence, from covering Donald Trump for you know, his entire presidency, all of the lies that he has told during the presidency are also fodder for that cross-examination. So I don't think the judge will probably allow all of it, but there is there is this is one where there is an you know unfortunately and it's a sad state of affairs for our country. There is an embarrassment of riches here. Yeah, uh, Adam, on the bond that uh, Donald Trump has apparently posted in, in the attorney general's case, uh, the Trump lawyers filed an explanation of that bond uh, late last night. We've had it uh, for the day. What do you see in that bond? What questions does it raise? The first question it raises is, why is it this thick? Why is it 114 pages of material when a bond written by a New York licensed insurer should be four pages? So immediately you want to know what is going on in here. Yeah. Uh, and, and one of the possibilities is that the, the collateral that, they, that they, the bondholder says he has from Donald Trump, $175 million so-called cash, there's a possibility that Donald Trump has pledged that money in other directions. So th this question is certainly raised. There is a Schwab account that apparently has $175 million in it presently. I note that they didn't redact the account number from the public internet filing. 
this moment, it has $175 million right. in it. And the question is, given that Trump and Trump's businesses are in business with this insurer and with others, to where else has this Schwab account been pledged? And why is that money still in Trump's control instead of deposited as collateral with the insurer? There are a lot of questions that are being raised here. And there's going to be a hearing on it uh, next week, and we'll get into the details of it then. Uh, Adam Pollack and Andrew Weissman, thank you both very much for joining us in this breaking news discussion tonight. Thanks for having me on. Thank Welcome. you. And coming up, we have a winner for the stupidest move of the year on the Senate floor, the move that short-circuited the attempted impeachment proceeding of a Biden cabinet official today. That's next. The United States Senate had its shortest impeachment proceeding in history today, thanks to the rank incompetence of Republican freshman Senator Eric Schmidt of Missouri. Eric Schmidt decided to object to a unanimous consent agreement requested by Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, an agreement worked out with Republican leader Mitch McConnell about how to proceed with the impeachment proceeding, something that the leaders always do with every impeachment proceeding. The rules are always different for every impeachment proceeding. And Eric Schmidt decided he had a smarter idea, and so he refused to agree to the unanimous consent request by Senator Schumer, whereupon Senator Schumer said, OK, then let's just vote to dismiss the whole case right now, which is essentially what they did after going through a few procedural votes on the Senate floor uh, thrown up there desperately and hopelessly by other Republicans like Eric Schmidt. The whole thing took a few hours. That was the end of it. There was no debate. Senator Schumer was offering the Republicans hours of debate. All of that was cut off by the idiocy of Republican Senator Eric Schmidt, a freshman who had no idea what he was doing on the Senate floor today. And so the Senate voted along party lines on the motion to dismiss and closed the book on the single most absurd impeachment case ever sent to the United States Senate, the so-called impeachment of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. That's all over. Meanwhile, in the House of Representatives, a vote is not yet scheduled on a series of bills introduced to fund, to fund urgent aid for Ukraine and Israel. The time has come for the House of Representatives to act and act decisively in America's national security interests. This is a Churchill or Chamberlain moment. We can either confront Russian aggression in defense of democracy, or we can allow the pro-Putin extreme MAGA Republicans to appease it. Joining our discussion now is Democratic Congressman Daniel Goldman of New York. He's a member of the House Oversight Committee and a former member of the House Majority Council. He was the House Majority Council for the first impeachment investigation of Donald Trump. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I know in your own experience in investigations on impeachment, I, I can imagine how absurd it was to watch what was going on in the House of Representatives. Chuck Schumer got that impeachment material today, looked at it, said to the Senate, this is unconstitutional. It does not present even refer to in the slightest any crime or misdemeanor of any kind. Uh, and so he went for that motion to dismiss. And of course, it was gone uh, as quickly as we all expected it to be when the Republicans in the House were working on it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the a very fitting end to what is a shameful, shameful moment in the history of the House of Representatives. Uh, even if you accept the allegations in the articles of impeachment, they do not rise to a level of any crime or misdemeanor, much less a high crime and misdemeanor. And of course, there is actually no evidence to support uh, the allegations that they have. And so the only proper outcome was not to legitimize this clearly partisan political effort to 
uh, help Donald Trump's election campaign by putting an impeachment on someone other than Donald Trump. And that's all this was about. As Secretary Mayorkas was negotiating a border security bill in the Senate, the House was impeaching him for failing to address the border. It does not get any more hypocritical than that. And the Senate did the right thing by the Constitution today, not because of partisan politics or in anything else. But the Constitution cannot withstand this kind of abuse by the House Republicans, nor should it. And Chuck Schumer, Majority Leader Schumer and the Senate Democrats absolutely did the right thing because this impeachment should never be legitimized. And, but it is one of the only things that the House of Representatives has actually voted on that the Republican majority has actually passed. They've done nothing on aid to Israel, nothing on aid to Ukraine. Yeah, they passed it after two attempts, let's not forget. Mm -hmm. They failed the first time and then just by one vote the second time. But I'm optimistic, Lawrence. We now have uh, in front of us uh, effectively the Senate border security bill, or rather the Senate uh, foreign aid bill that was passed uh, a number of weeks ago and has been languishing in the House as Ukraine has been uh, dwindling in its ammunition and its ability to withstand Russia. I, I cannot... I cannot emphasize enough to you how vital and urgent this aid is for Ukraine, uh, at first and foremost, because they are out of ammunition and Russia is making moves and pushing forward. Ukraine can win this war, as it had been doing prior to our delay in support, but they will lose this war if they do not get our support. And I am optimistic that we will be able to pass this bill uh, on Saturday. I frankly applaud Speaker Johnson for, for doing the right thing in the face of a lot of opposition from the party of Putin, which is the majority now of the House Republican Party. New York Congressman Dan Goldman, thank you very much for joining our discussion tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up. How Trump's favorite Republican Senate candidate, Arizona's Carrie Lake, is now defending the 1864 law that bans abortion in Arizona. Her solution for Arizona women didn't exist in 1864, the automobile. That's next. Here's what the Republican candidate for Senate in Arizona is telling women in that state about their new way of life living under an 1864 law banning abortion. Even if we have a restrictive law here and you can go three hours that way, three hours that way, and you're going to be able to have an abortion, we have to start with the minds and hearts of women and showing them that they can be alive. So get in your car and start driving. That's her solution. Today, once again, Republicans in the Arizona legislature blocked a move by Democrats to repeal that 1864 law, which has now become a 2024 law fully supported by the Republican elected officials in Arizona. After winning the vote to preserve that 1864 law today, Republicans in the Arizona House of Representatives celebrated. The University of Virginia's Center for Politics published an update on the Arizona Senate race today saying in Arizona's open seat Senate race, we now see the Democrats as a narrow favorite. So we're pushing that race from toss up to leans Democratic. Congressman Ruben Gallego is likely to face 2022 gubernatorial, gubernatorial nominee Carrie Lake. At this point, Ruben Gallego is ahead of Carrie Lake in fundraising. Axios reports today just about every Democrat running in competitive Senate races this year significantly outraised their GOP challenger in the first quarter. NBC News notes not only have Democrats been outraising their Republican challengers and building up their cash reserves, new fundraising reports also show that they're now largely outspending their Republican opponents. And Politico reports today how Donald Trump is harming Republican Senate campaigns and other Republican campaigns. In a letter received by Republican digital vendors this week, the Trump campaign is asking for down-ballot candidates who use his name, image, and likeness in fundraising appeals to give at least 5% of the proceeds to the campaign. That is a Donald Trump imposing a 5% Trump tariff 
on Republican candidates who will discover that like Trump's other tariffs, the campaign tariffs are not paid by China. Joining us now is Democratic Senator Gary Peters of Michigan. He's chair of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee. Uh, you are the mastermind of this big lead that the Democratic Senate candidates seem to have in fundraising at this stage. How important is that? Uh, it's incredibly uh, important uh, to have uh, the resources in order to uh, make sure that we have strong and robust uh, campaigns. You know, clearly what we're seeing this cycle is very similar to what we saw last cycle when we made history and were able to hold the Senate and expand that majority in a, in a midterm election. Uh, and we're on track to do the same thing. And in addition to raising record amounts of money, uh, and I'd say a big reason why we're doing that is we, quite frankly, we just have superior candidates. We have incumbents that have represented their states with honor and distinction and understand uh, the, their, their folks uh, better than anyone. And we're running against deeply flawed Republican candidates. You talk about Carrie Lake. Uh, she has become even more extreme than when she lost her race for governor. And she's taken a position that's clearly out of step with the majority of Arizona voters when it comes to reproductive rights for women. This clear contrast in relation to these resources, although we're going to need more because the Republicans have an awful lot of money, uh, especially dark money that's going to come in, which is why we need to raise money. The DSCC needs to raise money. We need to defend that's the Senate. That's why we have DefendTheSenate.org, our online fundraising arm, which is critical to make sure we can support these Democratic candidates who are in these tough fights, fighting for democracy and fighting for the, their state uh, and for uh, uh, really the future of this country. Uh, today, uh, Carrie Lake said to the women of Arizona, if you don't like living under an 1864 law about what medical services are available to you, get in your car and drive to California, where they will welcome you. Uh, this is what Republican campaigns are sounding like now. Uh, and it seems it, 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 there's no reason to expect they're ever going to come up with a better answer than that. No, I, I don't think so. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, you, you know, you hear Donald Trump, who, who is the architect uh, overturning Roe v. Wade. The reason women's uh, reproductive freedoms have been taken away is because of Donald Trump. He says, leave it to the states to do it. Well, we see what happens with some of these states. What's happening in Arizona, where there's an outright ban, where women who, who are not going to have any opportunity to get the kind of health care that, that they certainly deserve and to say that they have to go somewhere else. You know, in this country, and this is what Democrats stand for, in this country, every woman, regardless of where they live, should have rights that are protected. It shouldn't matter what state they're in. But clearly, that's not what we're seeing from Republican candidates. That's clearly out of step with the majority of the American people. And I think come uh, November, uh, we're going to hear loud and clear that uh, that uh, view is being rejected. And our Democratic Senate candidates are going to win uh, in all of these battleground states. Senator Gary Peters, uh, your reward for running the Senate campaign so successfully two years ago is that they asked you, begged you to do it again, <laughs> which is very, very unusual in that job. Uh, I'm not sure which of you has the tougher job, Chuck Schumer or you, uh, but you both uh, had a, have had a very strong week, to put it mildly. Thank you very much, Senator, for joining us tonight. Great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.